This week at St Chad's we have been marking the feast day of our founder, St Chad. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we've not been able to gather together to celebrate our patronal festival. And yet, St Chad is a vital figure for our own church life also for the life and history of the church in the old region of Mercia, the Midlands of England. And so in this short reflection, I want to share some thoughts about St Chad and perhaps suggest something from St Chad's life that might prompt us in these days to be responsive to the needs of others. And there's three things really I want to share all of which are taken from the Venerable Bede's Ecclesiastical History of the English Nation, the book in which we find outlined the mission of the church in the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th centuries, a book in which the history of the movement of God's Spirit is traced, but also a book which is a very important piece of historical writing in its own right, leaving aside the spiritual purpose that Bede himself had. Bede often spoke of how he was writing as a true historian. He was seeking truth in the middle of what he was sharing. And so St Chad, we know, came to Lichfield in about the year 669, 669 as the bishop of this area, the bishop of the Mercians. He was the first bishop to reside in what is now Lichfield. And we believe at St Chad's Church that he built his small community around a holy well, a spring well, that is fairly close to the site of the current St Chad's Church. And he built an oratory where his small community of perhaps seven or eight brothers lived together and prayed. And it became the base for his missionary journeys, the place he returned to, a place where he probably carried out baptisms as he welcomed new people into the Christian life. And there's three things I want to share about St Chad. The first concerns his humility, because Chad had already been consecrated as a bishop, the Bishop of York, but it was a time when the church was a bit divided, maybe nothing new there, and there were different understandings of authority and who had the right, if you like, to exercise that kind of authority. And so Chad was asked to stand down as Bishop of York. And he said this, and I'm quoting from Bede. If you know that my consecration as Bishop was irregular, I willingly resign the office, for I have never thought myself worthy of it. Although unworthy, I accepted it solely under obedience. Now, in many ways, we are not encouraged to think of ourselves as being unworthy. There is a sense in which we are all worthy of the love of God, of human dignity, of respect and so on. But Chad models something that wasn't so much about discounting his own gifts, but placing himself in the right place. He was humble. He was close to the earth. He lived simply. And he didn't curry favour or seek power. There was a part of Chad, I think, that was happy to withdraw from the limelight. He wasn't an egotist or a narcissist. And that humility is something that we are invited to share as a real contribution to the well-being of our society, our community, indeed the world, because it's in short supply. So that's the first thing I want to share with you, the humility of Chad. And the second thing, I've already hinted at it really, is prayer. Because when Chad arrived in Lichfield, the first thing he did was pray. He probably followed the old Celtic custom of spending 40 days in prayer and fasting before he set up his community. That was a period to assess the spiritual temperature, to discern the spiritual realities, to fight the spiritual battles, to cleanse the land of anything that was on it that was not healthy, not life-giving, anything that reflected the work of the evil one. 
And it's pretty likely that's exactly what Chad did to cover his ministry in prayer. I don't know about you, but we often rush into our planning, our strategizing, our working it out for ourselves. Chad seems to me got it the right way round. The real work was the prayer. The ministry was the fruit of that prayer. And we do know that at St Chad's, he lived by a rhythm of prayer. He lived in simplicity and humility, but prayerfully before God. And his attitude to the things around him was shaped by that prayer. Prayer wasn't an escape. Prayer wasn't something that took you away from the realities. Often Chad's prayer was forged in the midst of storms. And there is a little story that Bede tells about how he prayed when there was a physical gale. Bede writes this, I was told by one of his monks named Trumbert, who was one of my tutors in the scriptures and had been trained in the monastery under Chad's direction, that if a gale arose while he was reading or doing anything else, he would at once call upon God for mercy and pray him to show mercy on mankind. And if the wind increased in violence, he would close his book and prostrate himself on the ground, praying even more earnestly. So Chad brought into his spiritual conversation with God whatever was thrown at him. And that was tested in his last illness where he died of the plague. Perhaps a strange resonance with our times of pandemic, of Covid. But my point is, his prayer fueled everything else. And so if we seek to be inspired by Chad, we're, we're encouraged, we're challenged. But we're invited to share in that great, great current river of prayer. The great Anglican poet George Herbert wrote a great poem on prayer, which begins, Prayer, the church's banquet. Think about a banquet for a minute. How many courses, how much variety, how much celebration, how much community is implicit in that phrase. A banquet is not just fast food on the go. It's something to give an evening up to, if not longer. It's something to share with joy, with laughter, as well as with seriousness. Prayer the church's banquet. I somewhat think that Chad understood that. But there's a third thing about Chad that really struck me this week, and I don't think I'd noticed it before. In fact, it's a little story about what happened after Chad died. We know that when Chad died in 672, he was at first buried, probably again, where St Chad's church is. But then a little later, he was removed to a new site, probably where the cathedral now is in Litchfield, where his shrine was established. And what Bede says is that people visited the shrine, but also visited the place where he died and was first buried. And then it gets interesting because many of us have been brought up to be a bit suspicious of this kind of story. But let me just read it to you and make a few points because I think it might be a word for our times. It says this. Chad died on the 2nd of March 672 and was first buried close by St Mary's Church. That was the dedication of the church on the site where his community lived the site where St Chad's now is. But then it says, but when a church of the most blessed Peter, Prince of the Apostles was built later, his body was transferred to it, probably the site of the current cathedral now dedicated to Mary and Chad. Bede writes, in both of these places, frequent miracles of healing attested to his virtues. More recently, a madman wandering at large arrived there one evening and passed the night in church, unnoticed and unheeded by the watchmen. And in the morning, to the amazement and delight of all, he left the place in his right mind, showing clearly what healing he had been granted there by the goodness of God. It's a story we can easily pass over. We might, we might just think of it as 
a piece of medieval superstition. But look at the story. A lot of the stories about healing and miracles that we find in Christian writing talk about a particularly holy person who prayed for somebody else. We normally are told something about the means. This is different. This is someone who simply spends time in the place associated with Chad. There's no quick fix. There's no instant miracle. Someone who's described as a madman, and again, we probably wouldn't use that term now, but somebody clearly troubled, disturbed, not at peace, spends a substantial amount of time in a holy, peaceful place. And whatever you think about the notion of shrines and saints, that shows us something special about that place. And the reason I think that might be a word for our times is simply this. In pandemic, there are lots of people who are troubled. There are many implications for our mental health. Most of us will have experienced something of that and maybe are at this moment. Some are really struggling, whether they are younger people, older people, people with pre-existing conditions or not. Many are deeply stressed and burdened and wearied. Maybe there's a message here for the church to provide a space where people can be for long enough to find healing. We'd love there to be a quick fix. It's human nature. Sometimes we need to provide that place, that space, that relationship of hospitality for the healing grace of Christ to flow. And particularly for those troubled in their mental health. I think it's quite a profound story of how a madman, almost under the radar, simply visited a holy place and found their healing and wholeness of life and release and freedom. Don't know about you, but to me, that would be a worthy tribute to the ministry of St. Chad. If we opened up spaces of encounter for healing, for wholeness, for life. And if in any way these thoughts have spark something for you please know that we pray for you if you'd like us to pray specifically then let us know contact us look at the saint chad's church litchfield facebook page and post a message or contact us through the addresses that you'll find on our church website at www.stchads.org and know this, that there is peace and healing from the burdens of life. That's what St. Chad proclaimed. And it's what we too in our day dare to believe. So may God bless you in this week when we've celebrated St. Chad. And may you know his light and life, the light of Christ in all that you are and all that you do. And may your being be renewed in the same faith, hope and love that drove St. Chad to be an apostle to the Mercian region. And may God bless you. Amen.